Good morning. We're going to call this uh, meeting to order, this hearing to order. Uh, we are very pleased this morning uh, to welcome the administrator of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Brock Long, to discuss FEMA's fiscal year 2019 budget request. Administrator, welcome. We're glad to have you here. I want to start by thanking you for your leadership in overseeing not just FEMA, but the entire federal response to the record level of disaster activity this past year. Congress has now passed three supplementals providing nearly $50 billion for disaster relief fund. And this is for response and recovery from three catastrophic events. I'd like to hear from you today on how recovery efforts are going and what additional resources you think FEMA will need in the coming months to continue to support the long-term recovery. FY19 budget for FEMA is $11 billion. The request proposes reductions to existing FEMA grant programs while the, at the same time requesting $522 million for a new grant program that hasn't been authorized, at least not as yet. I'd like to hear from you why you propose these cuts, particularly in the current threat environment, and what is the new grant program's uh, what are the new grant programs intended to achieve? And I understand FEMA has also recently released a new strategic plan, which outlines your, your, give us an outline of your vision for the agency. I hope you'll discuss how you plan to implement this strategy and how FY19 requests support these efforts. And at this time, I'd like to recognize my distinguished ranking member, Ms. Robel Allard, for any remarks she may make. Good morning, Administrator Long, and welcome to your second appearance uh, before the subcommittee. The last time you appeared was on the heels of the damaging hurricanes and fires which prompted emergency supplemental spending bills. We are now eager to spend some time with you to get your perspective on FEMA's budget request, your ongoing response and recovery activities, and the challenges that lie ahead. I know this has been a difficult time for your, energy, uh, for your agency, you had uh, only been at FEMA for a few months when we not only experienced the most damaging hurricane season in history, but wildfires that devastated large swaths of my home state of California. Mr. Administrator, we want to help support the efforts of FEMA's personnel, and we want to make sure that FEMA's programs are working well to support recovery efforts. This is particularly true for Puerto Rico, because of the level of devastation on the island and the fiscal challenges it was already facing. We must not forget the families and other survivors who, months after the disaster, are still struggling to rebuild. And we must remember that this disaster occurred on American soil and that the people it affected are Americans. Again, we appreciate your joining us this morning, and I look forward to a productive discussion. Yield back. Uh, thank you, Ms. Robel Allard. We are joined by Ms. Loy, the uh, ranking member of the full committee. Uh, Ms. Loy, I'll yield to you for any comments you wish to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate your having this hearing. And thank you, ranking member Robel Allard, for holding this hearing. And Administrator Long, thank you for joining us this morning. You last testified before the subcommittee last November on the hurricane supplemental request. Thank you for your hard work assisting the states and U.S. territories, many of which are still recovering months later. This morning, we'll hear your justification for the FY19 FEMA budget request, which I find lackluster at best. You propose to eliminate several programs and to severely cut others with devastating implications, particularly to New York. For example, your uh, budget request would eliminate the National Domestic Preparedness Consortium, which has tra tra trained approximately 2 million first responders, the Emergency Food and Shelter Grant Program, which provides shelter, food, and water for families and communities in crisis. Your budget request would also notably reduce the National Pre-Disaster Mitigation Fund by 61 million, as we saw in the wake of Superstorm Sandy and Hurricanes Harvey and Maria responding to and recovering from a natural 
disaster often costs a lot more than investments in mitigation measures. In 2017 alone, there were so made, there were 50 major disaster declarations, 20 of which occurred after you were confirmed. We can all agree that communities need to be proactive in mitigating their own vulnerabilities. But this request, in my judgment, sends the wrong signal by cutting an essential program so deeply and could result in higher recovery costs to the federal government and communities hit by disasters. Your budget would also threaten the safety of our communities by significantly decreasing emergency management performance grants by 70.7 million, port security grants by 63.6 million, public transportation security assistance by 63.6 million, the state homeland security grant program by 117.6 million, the urban area security initiative grant program by 117.6 million, with threats of violence and terrorism on the rise. These programs are essential for terror targets like New York to help state and local law enforcement protect our communities. Simply put, our communities cannot strengthen their preparedness programs when support from their federal partner is inconsistent or so inadequate. Administrator Long, I look forward to a productive discussion this morning about how we can best build resiliency, mitigate the impacts of future disasters, and keep our communities safe from violence and terrorism. Thank you again for being here today. Thank you. We do have your written report uh, in the file. At, but we would like you just to give us a summation and sure. just give us what you think we need to hear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Member, thank you. And members of the community, uh, com committee, it's great to be here again today. And I think we're both, we're all here in the spirit of improvement and trying to find ways to make the, the, the nation more resilient and prepared. Um, I work towards it every day. And I look at this budget request. One, I think it's it was not informed by the 2017 season because of the budget process that puts forward. But I do look at this budget as an opportunity to uh, serve as an initial down payment on a strategic plan that I feel strongly about and the way forward that I want to talk to you about uh, to obtain your support going forward. Um, obviously, it was the biggest disaster year that we've seen in our history. Um, 47 million Americans, 15%, we now estimate, of, of the population was impacted in some way, shape, or form. Um, to date, I, I want to thank you guys for the, the three supplementals. It's been tremendous help, but more importantly, it's not that I need more money in some cases as much as I need new authorities. For example, disaster recovery housing is not a well-designed program. I need more granting authorities to be able to provide governors an opportunity to be able to control their own destiny, and I'm asking for your help on that. The, but what we've put forward so far as a result of 2017, we've obligated close to $22 billion um, from California to the Virgin Islands. $11 billion of that has gone directly to the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico already. These recoveries, infrastructure is not built overnight, and the recoveries are not going to be done overnight. We're going to be in these communities for years uh, as we progress through. So we learned a lot of major lessons. Uh, as I said, I need granting authority to fix housing. We have got to continue to find ways to, fra you know, to, to streamline fragmented recovery. Funding comes from 17 different agencies, not just us, and it's confusing to a governor. Um, HUD makes an announcement the other day. It's one of the largest um, you know, grants that the, that the agencies proactively put down, but it's confusing to a governor on how they utilize FEMA funding, HUD funding, and funding that comes from these others to do the greatest good, and I think we've got a lot of work to do to streamline our efforts to do the greatest good and ultimately build uh, more mitigation into our recovery efforts as well. Um, we also, uh, I'm asking for authorities to increase state management cost. So it's not just the, the grants that, that we need to provide to state and local governments to kickstart programs, but the management cost is probably the most beneficial tool that they can have. Right now, for example, on a disaster, uh, we provide them 3.34% uh, in management cost 
um, based on the total of public assistance dollars that we obligated. That number needs to rise to 12%. And that gives a state the ability to hire their own force account labor or hire consulting firms to help them with staff augmentation or technical expertise that they don't currently have. Because I believe that preparedness is everybody's responsibility from the citizen all the way to the governors, to the, to the states. And as disasters change, as threats change, we cannot do it all at FEMA. We cannot continue to fund and supplement programs in their entirety. And we have to have an honest conversation about is there too much of a gap between the federal government and what state and local governments are doing? And I'm, I'm here to have that conversation. But based on the major lessons learned that we had, based on um, comments of reaching out to our stakeholders, we took 2,300 comments from internal staff members and stakeholders, and I'm asking the question, what do you want FEMA to be good at? Where are we? Where do we need to be going forward in the future? We did a trend analysis based on what we got back, and we came up with three primary goals. One, as I've said before, goal one, build a culture of preparedness. We don't have it in this country. Our citizens are a true first responder. How do we open up more low to no cost options of preparedness to our citizens? How do we provide them more training to do things like CPR? Uh, the Red Cross has a statistic that one in four of us is going to do CPR in our lifetime. Uh, are you trained? Are you ready to go? You're the true first responder after an active shooter or a tornado. Um, you know, the, the second thing is, is that I'm aligning the budget, my assets, to also begin tackling the, the robust strategic plan. So, for example, under building a culture of preparedness, the $522 million grant, um, competitive grant that's listed in the budget would help me to start uh, addressing evolving issues because so much of the grant funding is tied to Bikimra, um, to old, uh, older style 9-11 traditional attacks, which could happen today, obviously, but it doesn't give you much freedom to be able to tackle new ev evolving threats such as soft target active shooter events or cybersecurity. So that, this would help me to, you know, these grants would help me to build more of a culture of preparedness. Um, the other thing about cultural preparedness is we got to invest, but also incentivize the state and local governments to step up and do land use planning and pass building codes and do more pre-disaster mitigation. So the cuts in pre-disaster mitigation, uh, with all due respect, the amount of funding that's always been traditionally in there is not enough. It's a drop in the bucket. I'm asking for a holistic fix to do mitigation up front in a much larger amount rather than on the back end. So. Um, I'm not even sure that 40, 50, or 60 million in pre-disaster mitigation really makes a difference when, when you look at the grand scheme of things of how we need to harden our capabilities, you know, going forward. Uh, I'm the biggest believer uh, in insur insurance as well when it comes to staff, uh, when it comes to people, and when it comes to self-insured cities. Um, we've got to close the gap on insurance under that building a culture of preparedness, and I, I want to work with you to do so. The second goal is ready the nation for catastrophic disasters. I don't believe this nation's ready to go for low to no notice events like New Madrid earthquakes or, or earthquakes in California, Wasatch, uh, you know, Cascadia. Um, and in many cases, we've got a lot of work to do and we have to bolster state and local capabilities to do their own commodities uh, when it comes to emergency life-sustaining, life-sustainment commodities and not just be dependent on FEMA to be providing everything. I'm not so sure we, we're that good that we can get there right after a no-notice event. And we have to build baseline capabilities at all levels of government because that's the best way response can work as a unified whole community effort. So underneath that, there's things that we're looking for. I'm worried about the wall of work that is coming to my agency as a result of what we just went through. If you look back at 2017, my agency picked up a new event every three days. Every three days we picked up a new event. I need staff members, and we're asking for that in this budget underneath goal two. I need, um, we're asking for 41 staff internally because I can reimburse everybody else, but I can't reimburse my own agency. And as we pick up more disasters, I'm worried about the operational capacity to do to respond to anything from congressional inquiries to processing paperwork to ultimately get money out down the road. So I'm asking for a down payment, you know, in this budget to help me bolster my staff internally as well. And then maybe the next year I'll continue to see the ramifications of what we've seen. Um, and then finally, reduce the complexity of FEMA is goal three. Uh, I, I'm the I'm the agency's worst. Uh, you know, uh, you know the, the, the biggest critic of the agency, I know that there are things that we can do. Uh, there are policies I want to strike down. There are things I want to clear up. And 
um, within this goal, uh, there's specific budget request to, for grants management modernization. I inherited an agency that has 10 different IT systems to manage 10 different grants. Why do we not just have one? But it takes money and understanding to how to consolidate those efforts, and I want to streamline it and make it simple, as well as streamline the disaster survivor and grantee experience. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, the, the one thing I would like to also explain is there's been a, a lot of misunderstanding about Puerto Rico and the recovery as well. Um, recovery has been ongoing um, since day one. A, a lot of emergency response and recovery projects are in place. Uh, I was in Puerto Rico last week, um, met with the governor, and we are now starting to, we've, we've finalized the dialogue on 428 to move forward on how to build a more resilient Puerto Rico. 428 is the best way to move forward, not just for Puerto Rico, but for communities in the future, because we're giving you a budget. It's outcome-driven recovery, which FEMA has never really had. It says, how does the state of California want their recovery to, to, to go as a result of this wildfire so that we're not back again? Governor, you know best. Local communities, you know best. So let's design that outcome-driven recovery now up front. Let's put the money towards it, and let's work towards that. And if you manage that budget, Governor Rosayo, very aggressively, whatever's left over, you can keep and put in and incentivize in pre-disaster uh, projects that you would like to see that were not factored into the original project worksheets. Because right now, if we attack Puerto Rico, the old traditional way of attacking recovery, we would be writing thousands and thousands of project worksheets that would get reversioned year over year over year. And, and I'm not sure that we would be working toward a common recovery outcome. So we were able to put that into place. It's not something that you want to rush. It's, it's something that you want to be very calculated and deliberate about. And uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency has no incentive to see anybody fail in recovery. I do not want to be back in these communities fixing infrastructure again. We can't afford to rebuild the way the infrastructure was before the event knocks them out. We have to do better and factor in pre-disaster mitigation before and after all of these events. I'm here in the spirit of improvement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that, that concludes my comments. Well, thank you. Uh, we're going to go on five minutes, uh, times five minutes, for everybody to know. Uh, and uh, by the way, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, speaks well of you, because we're this is a go-home day, and we've got a full house. I'm really proud of everybody being here. Uh, I'll start off, and then I'll go to Ms. Robel Allard. Congress has provided more than $49.5 billion to the Disaster Relief Fund in emergency supplemental funding to address the requirements from last year's unprecedented disaster activity. Can you give us an update on recovery efforts for Harvey, Irma, and Maria? And I've got other questions. That I'm going to yeah, so each one of these disasters, you can't compare disasters. You're not looking at apples and apples to apples. It's apples to oranges based on how these communities were, were impacted, uh, where they're geographically located, um, how strong was the infrastructure before the storm, uh, as well as the, uh, you know, the liquidity issues in the budgets and, and how they were managed. And so each one is, is dramatically different. Uh, as I said earlier, out of the 22 billion that we've obligated up to this point, and that number changes every day, um, up to this point, 11 billion has been uh, placed towards Puerto Rico, and roughly, I believe, five billion has been put forward towards Harvey, uh, and it's largely because uh, of the types of damages that we see uh, and the types of infrastructure that we're trying to fix. But these recoveries are ongoing. Um, in Puerto Rico specifically, I'm about to become the largest employer. Uh, I, we've already done close to 1,500 local hires, and what we're trying to do there is not only set forward an outcome-driven recovery for what it's going to look like next, but I'm having to rebuild uh, an entire arm of emergency management at the Commonwealth level as well as the local level, which is why uh, we're taking the initiative to do local hires. Uh, we're, we're, we're training them. We're, we're qualifying them in the FEMA qualification system so that we ultimately leave uh, a very strong and robust capability in emergency management there for years to come. Um, 
when it comes to Texas, yeah, we, we, we have major challenges. Um, you know, when it comes to housing, uh, we are going to have challenges in housing Puerto Rico, which is the most frustrating aspect of recovery where I need your help to change. We need granting authority. If I could give Governor Abbott, for example, granting authority, um, he could take funding from me and do housing the way he sees best. He could buy tent cities, he could do direct construction, he could buy a travel trailer, he could do a manufactured house, and he doesn't have to adhere to my bulky laws but his state laws. And he could do it much qu quicker and efficiently than I could. Uh, but right now the way it has to work is I've got to do an inter-service governmental agreement with the governor and he's got to follow my bureaucratic process which slows things down. And uh, we've got to fix it because I've never heard of a recovery housing mission that has ever sought praise from anybody, um, which, which, is, which is a real problem. Um, the, the, there's a lot that, that's, that's going on, but I have thousands of people in the field right now. 65% of my agency is still deployed, and it's not these four events that we're working. I'm working disasters, and, and 35 states and local territories have been impacted this year. Um, I couldn't be more proud of my staff and what they're going through and the sacrifices that they put forward, sir, uh, and they continue to serve others. Thank you. I agree. The staff has done a, a, a really fantastic job. But uh, estimates for Hurricane Maria beyond FY18 and the California wildfires were not available when the last supplemental came out. Right. Uh, do we have a better estimate for those disasters now? Mm -hmm. Will another supplemental be needed to address those needs? If so, can we expect to receive another supplemental request for funding to support these disasters? And will that request cover the entire life of the disaster for Hurricane Maria, or should we expect multiple supplemental requests? So right now, um, you know, it's hard to project how much it's going to cost. And some of the initials, like for Puerto Rico, some of the initial estimates, total damage estimates for Puerto Rico range anywhere between 40 and 50 billion as we start to uh, look at the, the, the levels of damage in the infrastructure. Here again, that number could change uh, as we dig deeper into the damage assessments and understand what really needs to be done to make it resilient. Those numbers could change. As far as requesting another supplemental, we're just not there yet, um, but I am not going to allow my agency uh, to get too close before we have to ask for your support. So we will maintain and double down on communication to the Congress uh, as well as OMB when it comes to a critical point of we think we're going to run out of funding. And I can get you the numbers on the other the other. Well, if, if, well. You, if you got other supplementals coming, which I would, I would assume you do, right. but maybe you don't assume that. Um, and that last supplemental we had requests and we didn't have information to give us the information we needed mm -hmm. to see the picture. Right. Uh, so if you're going to do other supplementals, that's why I asked that question. Yeah. We didn't, when we, on the wildfires in Maria, mm -hmm. we didn't have estimates. Yeah. Uh, I know that you flooded the place with people making estimates. You should have a better picture now than before. Sure. I can tell you that when I was in Houston, I was with some building contractors, and they said <coughs> there's 186,000 uh, remodels mm -hmm. estimated to be in Houston right now in a market that builds 50 to 100,000 homes a year. Uh, they can't even build the homes for lack of labor. Much They can't even meet goals in the home building uh, for lack of labor. And how are we ever going to have enough labor to do these lesser jobs? Because a, a framing contractor looking at a remodel and looking at a new home, there's no choice there. Sure. He's going to build a new home. Makes more money off of it. It's easier because he doesn't have walls and things he has to tear out. So it's, it's going to be a real challenge. I know it may not be even FEMA's job to direct, right. but ultimately that's things we got to fix. Yes, sir. And there's a... And there's if, a if this new plan, by putting it in the hands of the governor, which being at least my governor, I'd like to see that, uh, <coughs> it may be a good idea. In fact, it sounds like a good idea. But, you know, turning the ship of state... It's a mm -hmm. slow, tedious process. And, and Mr. Chairman, I, you know, when it comes to reducing disaster cost, um, I think we need to look at the categories of damage that FEMA pays for through the Stafford Act. In some cases, I scratch my head as to why FEMA reimburses um, state and local governments for building and contents that could be 
picked up by private insurance companies. Why are we paying to fix facilities that could be insured? And that right there would save a tremendous, would save billions of taxpaying dollars uh, and would help FEMA to further work with solid public-private sector partnerships in the insurance arena, which would reduce the need for supplemental requests down the road. When you get to these big, big disasters, our data would suggest that paying for public buildings and contents that are uninsured or self-insured is one of the greatest expenses that we have as taxpayers. And I question, why are we doing that? I think that's a good question to ask. And that may require some legislation at this level. And if, it, it, if, as you view it, have conversations with members of Congress about it. Yes, sir. Because if we're going to have to write legislation to, to redirect things, I think that's what we do for a living. Yes, sir. So, well, I'll yield now to Ms. Robel Allard. Uh, Administrator Long, I, I think uh, in your opening statement and some of the comments you've made, uh, to some degree you've already answered okay. uh, some, of, some of the um, uh, questions that I have. But I, I would like to ask them anyway and give you an opportunity to either add or to elaborate on what your efforts and, and your needs are. Uh, last fall, the president issued major disaster declarations for areas of California that were ra ravaged by wildfires. This came on the heels of several fire management assistance declarations for California in the preceding days. I understand that FEMA has already obligated $230 million in fire management assistance grants for S uh, FY 2018, and these grants are funded out of the Disaster Relief Fund base account. Is there sufficient funding in the Disaster Relief Fund base account to provide fire management grants for all eligible recipients. And with regard to the DRF base, is the budget request enough if we have a fire and hurricane season similar to last year's? So excellent question, and it's my understanding. You know, one, Mother, Na Mother Nature dictates how many, how many fire management assistance grants we're going to have to put out, and this past year was uh, an unbelievable year. Um, two, uh, the DRF, as you guys know, is is kind of dictated by the BCA and, and the formula that's put forward. My concern with wildfires um, and what we saw this year was the, the volume of wildfires can deplete the DRF towards the end of the fiscal year as we head into major hurricane season, which requires us to come to you for supplemental request. Now, the omnibus bill, as I understand it, did fix some of the problems uh, that many of the governors were having problems with when there were fires uh, occurring on federal lands, which is not FEMA's responsibility. Our role is to make sure that a fire doesn't get out of hand and become a major disaster declaration similar to what um, California put forth and, or, or, or was impacted by. It. And I think that the insurance industry looks at California as probably the worst wildfire on the globe that we've ever seen. It's one of the most disturbing events I've ever been a part of. The uh, supplemental appropriations bill for the hurricanes uh, provided up to $4.9 billion for disaster loans. Mm -hmm. These loans would help local and territorial governments with the costs associated with operating their governments, given that they are facing uh, lost revenues. Mm -hmm. In addition, uh, $300 million was provided for making loans to Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands to pay for the non-federal cost share of projects. My understanding is that the progress on making these loans has been uh, disappointingly slow. And I understand that to date only 54 million in loans have been made to municipalities in uh, Puerto Rico. And I have a, a series, three questions here. Okay. Can you update us on the progress of these loans and why the application process takes so long? And for Puerto Rico, are FEMA and Treasury working on a long-term estimate for the need of these loans and going forward, will FEMA and the Department of the Treasury be able to ensure these loans more rapidly, issue I, these loans more rapidly? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the question because there's a lot of confusion around this. Yes, FEMA does administer the, the Community Disaster Loan Program. Um, and, and not to belabor this point, but because of the liquidity issues that we were facing in the Commonwealth, um, you know, 
Treasury proactively and rightfully has stepped in to help under, help us understand the situation, but also for OMB to understand the situation around how much liquidity uh, Puerto Rico government actually has. And it's my understanding that when Puerto Rico's budget, what they have currently, reaches a critical low point of $800 million, then the loans can begin to, to be placed and, and Puerto Rico can draw down against them. So that was, uh, that was basically what the deal between Treasury and the governor was worked out in Puerto Rico. But I can come back for, you know, in writing for specifics. Okay, I would, I would appreciate mm -hmm. it. And Mr. Chair, will we have time for a second round? I don't know. Yeah. don't know. Okay, I'll, then I'll, I'll anticipate we do and, and, and yield back. Ms. Lowy. <clears throat> thank you very much, and thank you for your uh, presentation. Administrator Long, I understand that FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security are looking to change the way risk is calculated for metropolitan areas. This could impact the allocation of grant funding in both the state Homeland Security Ground Program, and the Urban Area Security Initiative. I'm aware that the threat is changing, and we need to take that into account. My concern is that rather than relying on a robust analysis of threat vulnerability and consequences, the risk analysis will be tweaked to fit what is only a perception of the evolving threat. That would defeat the purpose of having a rigorous risk methodology at all. So, has any independent third party outside of FEMA or Department of Homeland Security looked at the proposed changes to the risk methodology? And do you think it might be valuable to have an independent review from the GAO or some other source of expertise before you change the method for calculating risk? Sure. and and. Ma'am, I really appreciate the question as well because I don't want FEMA doing anything in a vacuum that becomes detrimental to anybody. Um, so, so let me be clear. And, and I'm, I'm a believer in double that, doubling down on communication. And when it comes to third-party review, we typically rely on reaching out to the National Emergency Management Association, International Association of Emergency Managers. Um, I, I don't have a problem with engaging GAO, uh, y y you know, as well because we want to do this right. The problem with the grant system is, is that I don't think that the federal government's ever done a good job of measuring return on investment or being able to, and I don't believe that the old risk formula was actually a formula at all. And so we, we have to be able to build a defensible formula that allows um, numerous communities access to, you know, to funding to help them kickstart recovery. When it comes to cost share, uh, and grants, I don't believe that it's FEMA's place to fully supplement a program through its cradle-to-grave life cycle. I believe that state and local governments need to have skin in the game, and I believe that um, these, these programs should be designed to kickstart initiatives and help communities to graduate their budgets to be able to continue going down the road of, uh, of a robust program in the future. Well, I think that's an issue that is really critical that we work together on. Yes, ma'am. Um, I understand your point of view, and in some instances I would agree, and some I probably sure. would not. I just want to mention one other program, the Nonprofit Security Grants and the State Homeland Security Grant Program. When Secretary Nielsen testified before the subcommittee, I asked her about a new grant program I fought to include in the most recent omnibus. Funding to nonprofits located outside of areas designated for the Urban Area Security Initiative will really help those organizations improve security at a time when hate groups are on the rise across the country in communications, large and small. According to recent reports by the Southern Poverty Law Center and the ADL, neo Nazi groups grew by more than 20% in the past year. Anti-Semitic incidents rose by more than 90% in New York in 2017 alone, and that's why I was so pleased to hear Secretary Nielsen state her intention to focus DH's efforts on hate groups widely, including white supremacy groups. This $10 million in funding will really help organizations, like some of those in my district, proactively combat the changing face 
of hate, threat, and violence. Uh, can you tell us when you expect the grant notice to be released, and when do you think the funding will go out? Um, I don't have an answer on the, the, the timing. We will definitely follow back on, follow back up with you. But uh, I would agree that this money, the, the non-governmental organizations that are active in disasters um, are incredibly important. They're one of the most <coughs> important pillars in the whole community, and we depend on them. We specifically depend on them to do things that we are bound by regulation that keep us from being nimble in some cases. So we look forward to putting this money to work, and we will get back to you on the time frames. Thank you. thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you for your presentation. You seem so well informed, and we are very honored to have a person of your caliber take on this responsibility. This, the chances, <laughs> the, the challenges are just incredible. And I know we discussed Puerto Rico, so I won't bring that up today, but I hope you really stay on it because the tragedy was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. When you're up in that helicopter and you see all the homes without roofs and the electric grid and the water and the food and the jobs. So thank you for your leadership, and I hope you really stay on it. Thank you, And don't forget um, St. John's as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Brock. Appreciate you and your service, and, and please give our best to everybody that's under you. I know that they have a very challenging environment to work with, as do you. Lots of challenges. I'm 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 very happy to hear some of your uh, some of your comments about streamlining the agency, and and also um, I do want to touch on Puerto Rico just just briefly. I was just down there last weekend in uh, Oricovis, and. Understanding that there are, as we talked about just a little bit earlier about deferred maintenance and some issues with Puerto Rico themselves have had that we're not prepared, if you will. Um, but obviously, we still have to go down there and help, and help out to make sure that we're doing everything we can to make them more resilient and have, um, you know, that they have a more robust system. So, one of the questions that I have, I was speaking with the mayor down there of Oricovis, and, and he was, it's my understanding that, you know, that the municipalities will spend their money, of course, to to fix infrastructure and then get reimbursed. Um, however, they don't have a lot of money, right? So then they, they sort of run out and it's not fixed or finished and we have another upcoming hurricane season. So I'm just curious, is there, what's, ha what's happening to make things more efficient? Um, or, and is there a way to, to do so to, to make sure the infrastructure is fixed before um, the next hurricane season? So Congressman, great question. Uh, there, there's, I mean, to, just to be honest, there's no way we fix the infrastructure before next hurricane season. What we're trying to do is, is um, well, I can tell you that we're proactively when it comes to the money management and kickstarting the projects and making sure that project worksheets are, are being estimated and work is being done. We're embedding staff with the 78 mayors, um, and we're, we have embedded staff um, a long time ago to be able to work with them directly to navigate. But we're in the train-the-trainer process as well, as I said earlier, uh, with the 1,500 local hires or approximately 1,500 local hires that we've done. Mm -hmm. And that's my army going out and basically um, helping – helping these jurisdictions navigate. When it comes to the infrastructure, um, we got to remember, you know, for example, a lot of the power, a lot of the power grid wasn't functioning before the storms. Sure. And you guys gave me the authorities to fix that. Um, and then there's just so many, we're, we're putting temporary roadway systems in until uh, roads can be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. So uh, we just have a long way to go. We're going to be there for, for years. Now, what we're doing to get ready for hurricane season um, we're rewriting um, emergency operation plans for all 78 jurisdictions. We're also rewriting plans with the Commonwealth. On June 14, um, all of our efforts to write the plans, train upon the plans, is going to be exercised on June 14 with a full-scale exercise. Um, I'm exponentially increasing the amount of food, water, and supplies that we, we, we have on the island. Um, and then we're going to run through plans of distribution uh, for commodities and the commodities that we roll out during the exercise, we're going to allow the 78 municipalities to keep, you know, so that they can build their own levels of preparedness uh, on a daily basis. So One quick thing yeah, on, yeah. The, on the efficiency of reimbursements for the locality so they, they get you know, money sure. back to be able to do what they need to do locally. Is that, um, is, is that being looked at, I guess, yeah. uh, to make sure they get reimbursed faster? 
Right, and, and in some cases we may be entering into what are called expedited um, processes to be able to uh, get funding to them if there's liquidity issues or the lack of funding that's there. And we do that, we did that in Texas. We, we, we did it in numerous locations uh, uh, across the number, across the country. But I, I'd be happy to respond to you in, sure. in writing on, on how we're actually managing the money processes at the local levels. One quick question, Does, uh, is FEMA looking at new technologies to help with disaster relief to get things, products faster? So for example, you mentioned housing, things like 3D printing housing, housing and things like that. Uh, excellent question. So under uh, the third goal of reduce the complexity of FEMA, there's $124.6 million ask in the 19 budget for specifically critical infrastructure and analytics investment because we've got to do a better job of, of understanding uh, the interdependencies with our own agency, but how we interact uh, with the 16 critical infrastructure sectors to make sure that we're making the right decisions and, and putting money down in the best way we can. Appreciate it. One more last thing, uh, the, uh, under the administration, politically there's been some, some hits, of course, uh, about reducing programs that have been helped with things like sea level rise. So in coastal Virginia, Hampton Roads, that's, that is an issue, regardless of what you think politically, how it gets there. We have soundings, and so there's sea level rise. Um, that so for, in terms of resilience and helping communities, uh, is that something? And, and, and let me let me also say there are a lot of programs in the government that need to go away that don't that are well intended but may, may not work well. Are we in your your mention of a culture of preparedness? Are we also working with resiliency in areas like Miami and Hampton Roads and Louisiana for sea level rise? Sure. So um, you know I had a conversation the other day with a very talented uh, forecaster from NOAA by the name of Chris Lancy, and we were we were discussing that the ocean seems to be rising about one inch every ten years. Uh, obviously, um, we have to start accounting for that, and our strategic plan embodies this. So that's why I'm asking for pre-disaster mitigation, a real mechanism to do pre-disaster mitigation up front, um, that we're not having to negotiate or it doesn't get zeroed out every year by every president that goes forward or whatever, that there is a mechanism to help communities start to elevate roadway systems and infrastructure in anticipation of sea level rise. The other thing is, is that, um, I mean, obviously FEMA can't stop sea level rise. That would be the equivalent of us saying we're going to stop plate tectonics as sure. well and, and halt all our earthquakes. What we can do is ready, ready the nation for catastrophic disasters as well. Um, but a lot of the flooding issue, uh, we anticipate that over 30 percent of the flooding that, that, that we see across the country is because of the built environment the newly built environment and the way we're expanding without proper land use planning and building codes. So there's a multitude of things that we've got to start putting forward. And I believe that disaster resilience is in the, it's in the hands of the state and local governments to pass those land use planning laws and, and, and um, building codes. My agency gets to deal with the consequences for the lack thereof. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I'm Mr. Yeah. Brock, appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Mr. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Administrator Long. Happy to um, see you back here at the subcommittee to congratulate you on your, um, your uh, good work and um, also acknowledge uh, a fellow North Carolinian. Uh, hope you still claim that. Headed there today. All right. <laughs> Maybe I can ride with you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. Um, well, speaking of that, I have only one shot here, but I do want to ask a couple of questions and, and hopefully we can deal with both of them because they have to do with part of your broader support system. Uh, the National Service volunteers who, uh, who are playing an, an, an increasing role in, in disaster uh, relief and recovery. And then the work of the uh, uh, center at, uh, at UNC Chapel Hill, the um, Coastal Resilience Center, which I understand you're going to be addressing uh, on, on Monday, which we're, uh, we're glad to know. Um, both of these are problematic in the President's budget, which is a nice word for being zeroed out. So that's why I bring them up. And uh, I, I want to ask you about uh, the value of, um, of, of, of these aspects of your support system. First, National Service. You know very well that all hands on deck are required as a North Carolinian and, and, and now in your national role. Um, volunteers are often a crucial part of, of the response and, and recovery. Um, we did form a new National Service Unit, the FEMA Corps, in 2012. I understand that something like 4,000 National Service uh, volunteers were involved in 2017 alone in, in, in relief and recovery efforts. They act as force multipliers. I, I'm going to ask you, actually, to, to describe what, what they do. 
uh, what what do these volunteers do to, to um, uh, extend the reach of emergency relief and and help ensure the long term recovery of, of communities? Why on earth would the administration zero out national service? Um, are are there any other barriers that exist to volunteers that Congress should address? But um, I, I, um, I I'm. Chair, I'm co-chair of the National Service Caucus. I have seen this firsthand in North Carolina, and so I'm baffled by the budget, but I'm also, of course, in, in, uh, encouraged by the support um, that they've increasingly, volunteers have increasingly offered in um, our national uh, recovery capacity. Sure. Um, obviously, taking this job, <laughs> taking this job is, uh, you know, I, I became administrator in a very tough budget environment, um, and unfortunately, cuts have to be made here and there, and uh, I've got multiple training facilities. Like when it comes to universities, I would love to be able to fund a ton of programs, but I also have EMI, I also have the Center for Domestic Preparedness, which are very expensive institutions dedicated to training, and I almost have to, you know, I need to concentrate somewhat on my own shop within FEMA. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to FEMA Corps, FEMA Corps is a great program. You know, the bottom line is, is that, you know, it, it provides a jumping on point, you know, for people to get involved in emergency management. And we make a concerted effort to hire those who have gone through FEMA Corps uh, into the disaster core positions or PFT positions as they come available where we can. Uh, we, we try to do that. But, you know, Congressman, it's just, it's a tough, it, you know, tough calls have to be made. And uh, when it comes to, and, and let me say this, it's not just providing money to state and local governments. I think 2017 should be a reflection point for state legislatures and local elected officials to reevaluate how much they're staffing and funding their emergency management programs. I cannot continue to supplant them in their entirety. And, and I'll go back to my, my, my experience as director of Alabama Emergency Management Agency. My general fund budget was somewhere between five and seven million dollars to run a state emergency management agency. During the height of the 2017 season this year, FEMA was spending that in a matter of an hour. So I'm spending $300 million a day at the federal government level. And literally that's, that, you know, a general fund budget of a state agency is spent in less than two hours. There's too much of a gap. And I'm also trying to combat the fact that there's a reduction in grants, which makes up most of the budget cuts, by introducing what we call FEMA integration teams. I'm ready to take the staff that I have out of my regional offices and out of headquarters and move them into the state agencies, which we're, we're embarking on this week. We're beginning to phase this out to where we're putting full-time staff in state agencies to be a part of the discussion every day, but also to help them overcome the planning gaps that they may have when it comes to staffing as well. So it's, it's not just funding, it's getting my people out, but I also, as I said earlier, the greatest thing that Congress can do to help the states is increase the management costs from 3.34% to 12%. Um, and we can use disaster relief funding to help them augment their staffing capabilities. So it's not, we gotta, we can't just singularly, singularly, singularly look at grants What's the, what are the multiple tools in the toolbox that we can collectively provide to states? And that's the way I approach this job. Mr. Chairman, I know my time's expired, so I'm gonna ask uh, the administrator to submit for the record a direct answer to my question about okay. uh, the role of, of national service volunteers in 2017 and, and otherwise, and also to uh, answer the question I was going to ask, had there been sufficient time, about the role of the Coastal Resilience Center, the Mr. storm Price, surge. I'll, 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 I'll yield you that time. Okay. All right. All right. Well, yeah. thank you. Let, let, me, let me just ask directly about that. If you have, uh, you, you submit whatever you want to about the National Service. You, yes, sir. You really didn't address that. And then this Coastal Resilience Center, uh, as I say, you're going to be there on um, Monday. I'm sure you're going to be thanking them for what they've done. Uh, it's my understanding their storm surge modeling played a large role in FEMA and the Coast Guard's decisions about where to place people and assets during Hurricanes Harvey and, and Irma. Uh, I wonder if you could elaborate on that, and any of this you can, of course, elaborate for the, for the record. But tell us more about the importance of the center's work, and what are your thoughts about eliminating all the funding for this? So uh, Gavin Smith, who runs the program, is a good friend of mine. Um, he, he is a very smart mitigation mind uh, minded subject matter expert. The, the bottom line is it boils down to here again, it's a tough budget environment. Should FEMA be funding universities um, 
you know, and, 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 you know, how many of these programs should we fund nationwide or do I need to concentrate on, you know, do I need to concentrate on working with our partners? You know, NOAA also does storm surge, uh, you know, does storm surge modeling that we depend on. And well, if that's the case, let me, tough. and our yeah. time's limited. If that's the case, if this is duplicative, if the work of the Coastal Resilience Center really isn't needed, then you need to document that. Right. You need I'm not to document saying that. It. I'm not saying it's not needed. I'm just saying, for me, I can't fund it all. Is it redundant? I, I don't know enough about the program. Well, I think somebody right. should look at this. I mean, this yeah. is siloed, it looks to me like. Mm -hmm. It's siloed, and, and you're talking about budgets that aren't directly in your purview, but it's certainly budgets you should care about. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me if you care about it, if it's important to your work, you should say so. We, we need some assurance that within the administration, these conversations are going on. And that uh, the, the, that functions that are critical to something as, as important as, um, as uh, the work of FEMA, that those are highlighted. And, and that if there is something that we can safely eliminate, then we need to have the rationale for it. Right. And I'm not at a point to tell you what should be el eliminated against at this point, you know, or, or I don't know the ins and outs of the coastal. I'm going there to learn, uh, to be honest. And, and uh, you know, and I appreciate everybody that's trying to put forward better information to FEMA, and we have to be able to utilize it. But here again, I only have so much funding, and I have to make hard decisions, and, and we have to make hard decisions. So I would be happy to respond to you in writing. Once I learn, uh, you know, more about the Coastal Reserve, you know, Resiliency Center, I'd be happy to respond in writing. Um, you know, about what we found. Good. I will appreciate that and, and also a response in terms of the more specifics about the, the national service input. Sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Oh, you're welcome, Mr. Price. Uh, nope. Mr. Palazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brock, thank you for being here today. Um, yeah, I've, I've known a, several FEMA administrators, and you seem to be one of the best ones I've heard explain your agency, so thank you uh, for your honest and clear answers. Uh, real quick, you know, I'm from Gulfport, Mississippi, Mississippi's fourth congressional district. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing you can relate to that is Hurricane Katrina. Uh, we were ground zero, and um, we took it right on the chin. And it took almost a decade for us to, um, you know, be comfortable in our recovery. And um, the one thing, uh, the Gulf Coast, and not just in Mississippi, but coastal areas and any, any, any place that lives on or near the water, which is practically a majority of the, human, the population in America, um, the, relies on insurance, the NFIP program. And Mississippi alone is 64,000 NFIP policies. Right. In 2013, uh, Congress you know, tried to um, improve the NFIP program only to uh, basically you know, cause a lot of um, unforeseen problems. And with that was the drastic rate increases on, on homeowners who had no fault of their own were in the NFIP program because it was a government program and it was only insurance available. Overnight, they were going to see their rates go up, you know, you know, tr double, triple, quadruple. Uh, and, you know, that was a big concern. And Congress acted swiftly uh, it, I think the term was unintended consequences is what mm -hmm. many of us used on the floor. Uh, now, the bill was tied to some other things, such as the Restore Act, which was the delivery of the, the, the penalties from the BP oil spill and a two-year uh, surface transportation extension. And so, you know, the fact that we were going to find a longer-term solution to NFIP, the reauthorization, because prior to there was 16 or more short-term reauthorizations, and obviously those reauthorizations and the fear of it expiring and you can't get a mortgage if you're required to have flood insurance. So it was affecting home ownership, home building, you know, uh, economic development. It's just the uncertainty and instability of the market. Now, well, guess what? Uh, fast forward, you know, the House has passed a bill which is impassable. Um, it ha has some good reforms. There's no way it'll ever pass the Senate because it's going to increase rates on homeowners. Uh, and it's going to cause, again, market, market disruption. But, you know, we're for, you know, moving as much of this to the private sector as possible, but there's not a private sector market right now in many areas. 
And so I guess the thing is, can you kind of tell me, has the, the fact that we haven't reauthorized the program, it looks like we're constantly searching for must-pass legislation to attach even the short-term reauthorization to, is that having any effect in your, in, uh, on your agency right now? Well, the problem, you know, well, thanks to the Congress, uh, those supplementals helped us in debt forgiveness right off the bat. Every time we have a massive event, it, it, it gets to a point where FEMA can't even pay the interest bill anymore on the NFIP program. And so we need to make the NFIP program financially solvent. And I don't have all the answers on that, but sometimes I think we may be attacking it um, in the wrong manner. So, for example, any house in the United States can flood. Why are we just solely focused on these flood zones? And what we learned from Harvey is thousands of homes can flood outside of those zones that were not depicted in there, particularly if street drains are not well maintained or the built environment changes the flood zone quicker than the mapping changes. And so every house can flood. I often, you know, we're working until there's a legislative fix, I'm working you know, and, and my mitigation guys are working with the private industry through reinsurance. And I believe that we, you know, we, we've offset some of that cost and saved taxpayers over $700 million most recently with getting them to back us up through reinsurance. The, the thing about NFIP and what runs through my mind, and we would have to talk to the private sector to start dialogue, but why is flood insurance not connected to every insurance policy in America? Why is there not an all hazards insurance policy every time you buy a house. And so you reduce the cost, you spread it out, it becomes more affordable. And I mean, I don't know why we have to have this a la carte system of you got to have fire insurance that you can let lapse if you've paid off your house. Um, you can choose or not to choose to buy an FIP flood insurance if you're outside a special flood hazard zone. Why are why are we not working with the private industry on a more innovative solution of saying, can we get to an all hazards based insurance package for a homeowner? All hazards uh, sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I want to be very sensitive of my time. It is a fly out day. And um, thank you, Mr. Brock. And I have some several questions related to mapping um, on the Mississippi Gulf Coast compared to my neighbors in Louisiana and Alabama. And I'll submit those for the record. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Ruppersberger. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. And, uh, you know, as, uh, we have a lot of people who, who we ask questions, but uh, it seems to me you're pretty well respected, and that's based on your actions. And, you know, a good manager is only as good as his team, too, so I'm sure you have a good team. Um, you know, you're one, one of the most important agencies, I think, in, in the government because uh, you protect the American people and our critical infrastructure uh, uh, from a host of evolving threats. Um, it's one of the only agencies which the public hopes never have to deal with. Um, when you see a FEMA van or tent, you know something tough or terrible has happened. Uh, however, uh, you're a lifetime um, facing tragedy, and we basically saw that severe tragedy. As you said, last year was probably the worst year you think FEMA's had. Is that, that correct? I would, I would argue yes. Okay. Uh, during this time, FEMA, I think you delivered 138 million meals, 194 million liters of water, and 1,310 generators to power critical facilities supporting survivors impacted by the, the four major hurricanes. Um, and while improvements can always be made, I think your agency should be impressed with this good work. Now, I want to just focus on one issue today, and that's uh, port security grants. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I re <clears throat> represent the Port of Baltimore, and I've been involved in a lot of port security issues and written reports on, on the, that issue. Uh, I'm discouraged by the administration's deficient funding request uh, for the Port Security Grant Program. This program was included in the original uh, Department of Homeland Security authorization. And in my eyes, this is clear evidence that Congress recognized the urgent need to secure our ports. Each year, America's ports generate $4.6 trillion in revenue and employ 23 million people throughout the country. And now with the expansion of the Panama Canal, we can only expect to see even more of an increase in that area. The bottom line is that the economic impact of seaports cannot be understated. According to the Brookings Center for the 21st Century Security and Intelligence, it would take a small attack on our ports to grind U.S. commerce to a halt within days. Um, thus, the need for port security cannot be understated. For this reason, we need to protect our, mar our maritime infrastructure. Uh, the Port Security Grant Program assists both large and small ports with chemical, biological, nuclear, and explosive detention. 
and funding can also go towards bolstering cybersecurity capabilities and implementing transportation worker identification credential card systems. <clears throat> My question is I have three. Uh, first, in your opinion, do you believe that the Port Security Grant Program has been a valuable tool in combating terrorism? To me, a cut to this program implies that our ports have shored up all of their vulnerabilities. I assume you don't believe that's the case. And three, do you believe our ports are being built for resilience against rising sea levels and severe storms, which are increasing in intensity and frequency? Right. So, so when it comes to uh, port security, it's my understanding that we spent quite a bit of money through grants to build a baseline capability. And what we don't do a good job of in the federal government when it comes to the return on investment is what point – what point do we build that baseline and have a handoff to the to the port authorities and to the state and the local governments and should and should grants start to graduate and and reduce over time as we build a baseline capability or do we just keep continuing to grow this budget and the grants indefinitely and basically i, I become uh, the, the person that supplements these grants in entirety. And then what happens tomorrow is the threat changes. I've got to find new money to address this problem or that problem. And I think that this is one of those grants where we build a tremendous capability, but where's the handoff to, you know, and, I, and I'm fairly asking the question, where's the handoff to the port authorities, to the state and local governments, and I, as well as the private sector that uses those ports as well? Well, in my opinion, it's based on which port the management of the different ports. Mm -hmm. But I, that's why I, in the beginning I talked about how important ports are, trillions of dollars. I mean, it just just a shutdown when we had, I think, a strike at the, at the uh, port in California. I mean, this is, there, there, this is a tremendous industry with a lot of vulnerability, a lot of drugs coming in. Uh, we had yesterday, we talked about how we, we're, I don't think any port has the manpower to deal with the drugs that are coming in, especially, especially fentanyl. So I would suggest that you look at it and sure. you need to manage where the money is going. But I think the federal government has to step in when it relates when it relates to ports. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Gosh. Mr. Culberson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Long, we really appreciate your work, especially appreciate your clearly earnest and sincere desire to get the money out the door as soon as you can to front load the funding for disaster victims, to put it in the hands of property owners who are going to take the best possible care of their own property, mm -hmm. get it out in the hands of governors and local authorities is the right way to do it. I'm convinced that your uh, approach and your attitude is lies at the heart of the reason that Donald Trump was elected president because people feel the government is so badly broken that they elected this guy from outside of the entire process as a businessman to just get her done, get things fixed and done. They just want action and decisive action. And I would encourage you as um, – as a, uh, somebody who served, I've started in the Texas House and, I, and uh, served here in Congress and know that if a law is maybe a little ambiguous or seems to leave you an opening, just do it. I mean, sure. uh, get to yes. I've heard you say that before. We had a very good meeting. Governor Abbott and I came in to see, and I know that you've instructed your staff on repeated occasions, don't tell you the reasons you can't do something, tell you the reasons you can do it. Mm -hmm. And I'd encourage you to just be bold and uh, assertive and uh, to get to yes, and if the law looks like it's ambiguous or gives you an opening, just do it. Um, you've been terrific when it comes to requests that we as Texans have submitted to you, and I asked you to extend uh, hotel stays for disaster victims. You've done so. Increase the federal share for debris removal. You've done so. Uh, concur that extreme circumstances existed so contracting could be expedited. You did so. Uh, but there are a couple other really small fixes that you've got authority right now to do mm -hmm. that would make a dramatic difference for um, homeowners, who thousands of whom are living on the second floor of their homes in my district with all the sheetrock torn out on the first floor. And they have... Um, over there uh, because the, in many times they were denied rental assistance. And if you go to the FEMA website and, and log on and uh, to the FEMA.gov website and ask what specific items are covered by housing assistance, it tells you that this housing assistance includes reimbursement for short-term hotel expenses, money to rent a place to live for up to 18 months while your home is being repaired. And an immediate question a homeowner has, administrator, is does my income matter? Well, the law says, no, it doesn't matter. And, in fact, your website says, that question, does my income need to be under a certain dollar amount to qualify? Answer, no. FEMA's housing assistance program is available regardless of income to anybody who suffered damage or losses. But that's not the way the bureaucrats in FEMA are administering the program. They are denying 
rental assistance to thousands of my constituents mm -hmm. who have sunk all their money in their home. They're not wealthy. They've got kids in college, uh, a mortgage that they're still paying on a home that's flooded out mm -hmm. and having to pay rent in a lot of cases to stay in the school district and a lot of expenses, and they're being denied uh, rental assistance. But you've got the authority literally to just change that and, mm. and and comply with what is on your website. Would you please do that, and how quickly can you do that? So, Congressman, as, as we spoke the other day, uh, you I've been raised, on you about this. No, 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 and I, and I appreciate it because I wasn't aware of the issue until you raised it. And so, um, the, you know, the bottom line is is that it spawned um, – very deliberate conversations, and we're actually going to be entering into the rulemaking con um, process to look at a whole host of why do we put these ramifications on individual assistance all to, to begin with, right? But you could do this. Some you of it, the, yeah. But I get but the I, lawyers yeah. arguing with each other. Just do it. Just get her done. That's what this election yeah. was about. American people voted to get her done. Right. And Please. we'll continue. I will continue to work with you, and I appreciate you raising the issue. Um, as you know, I am always in a rock and a hard place when it comes to being deliberate and understanding that that policy that was put into place. I found out the other day that it was put in as a result of the 2001 uh, events, uh, in the, the terrorism events in New York. And I'm trying to understand why. And I'm trying to understand what the ramifications are uh, by moving it. But we're trying to move as quickly as we can. And I will stay I'll stay in contact with you. Now, you're a bold, decisive person. I can tell you're letting the lawyers discourage you and slow you up. Don't let don't do that. Yeah. It's, it's clear as right. well. Just just go for it. Uh, this um, the hazard mitigation grant program is another one that I'm concerned about. As I understand it, the state of Texas will receive $1.1 billion in FEMA hazard mitigation grant program funding this year. But as you know, this funding is awarded to the states on a formula basis after a presidentially declared disaster impacts an area. Uh, Administrator Long, could you describe, please, how these programs uh, – or uh, what types of projects these funds can be used for, and how quickly this money will flow to the state of Texas, and, and what role does FEMA play in approving the projects recommended by the states, and what kind of projects have been uh, proposed so far, and what well, can be done to um, speed it up? You know, I don't, I don't know what, what they propose so far, uh, but the, the HMGT, HMGP post-disaster mitigation program is, a, is a, based on a percentage of public assistance dollars. I think it's and uh, I'll get you the exact uh, formula. I think it's like 15% of the public assistance dollars that we put forward in a disaster becomes available in post-disaster mitigation. The cost share on that is set by the Stafford Act at 75-25, so I don't have any authority that I'm, I'm aware of to be okay. able to waive that 25%. As far as the um, – we can serve as an advisor, but, uh, you know, going back to states' rights, the governor's in control of that response and recovery uh, and so what Thank my you. job is, is to make sure that, you know, Governor Abbott is, you. you know, we're, we're helping to meet his mitigation recovery goals. Not That's mine. what we want to hear. Texas yeah. can move a lot sure. more quickly. And if, Mr. Chairman, if you'll permit me, since we just got this one round and we've got so many folks out there hurting, I can I ask very quickly about the dollar program? Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. The um, does that direct assistance for limited home repair program is administered by the General Land Office and unincorporated areas in the city of Houston inside the city limits. And I've heard from constituents there's been a lot of confusion and delay regarding this dollar program. And I understand that GLO plans to end the program, the General Land Office, to end the program for the unincorporated parts of the city of Houston and Harris County, and that the city of Houston only recently got underway with administration of the program within the city limits. It's been really spotty. Mm -hmm. Do you Are you aware what's the current status of the program? And what can you do to help, once again, I, I, take a blowtorch to whatever bureaucracy right. you so, need to? So here this. again... What would fix this problem is granting authority on housing. If you can give me the granting authority to provide funding to a governor, down through a governor, to allow that governor to control housing and do housing the way he or she would like to, it would a governor will outmanage us. They will do it more efficient and effectively. The problem with the inter-service government agreement, and the reason we went this way is I don't have enough manufactured homes to handle the flooding in Houston. I mean, the population of Harris County alone is more than Puerto Rico. Sure. Well, as the judge said, there's 186,000 homes being remodeled. Right. And so we had to put numerous options on the table. And I, I put travel trailers back on the table. Uh, that, that They were taken off the table for some reason because I knew that there was going to be a shortage in housing. We tried to be innovative in this inter-service governmental agreement, and Governor Abbott boldly and courageously stepped up to lead it. He's one of the only governors that's ever done this. And... I commend him for it. But the problem is, is the mechanism is not right. Um, 
And I'll admit it now, uh, I think if it would be better because he's got to adhere and purchase housing or, or provide funding to the homeowner under my bulky Code of Federal Regulations yeah, are not going the through states. The state. and you know, much better going through the yeah. state. And I thank the chairman for the extra time. It's appropriate as we, yeah. Mr. Chairman, very quickly celebrate Thomas Jefferson's 275th birthday today that uh, we remember that the founders intended, and Mr. Jefferson in particular, that the states administer things that affected only the states. And Jefferson liked to say regularly that if we would just follow the Constitution and apply it that standard to any problem, no matter how complicated, he said the Gordian knot will always untie itself. So you're on the right track. Let Governor Abbott, you, let Texans run Texas, we'll take care of it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Ms. Rowell Allard would like to have another round, and so we, there's just three of us left. So we're going we're gonna to have another round. Okay. I'm going to start off, once again, a program it looks like you're about to eliminate, <laughs> which I have a, a lot of interest in, the National Domestic Preparedness Consortium. My state is a state with a lot of big cities. <coughs> But it's a great big place. And got more little towns than we got big cities. <clears throat> and the training center at Texas a &M University trains our first responders. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and literally every small town in Texas is blessed by that mm -hmm. being able to train. Uh, to say that we no longer are going to have that available is to say that two thirds of my state is going to have both medical and firefighting at a minimal level, and and I don't, I don't understand. I would like it explained why that is necessary. <coughs> now, if it's because it's administered by a university, and you know I, I can understand prejudice against big universities, not they're like big government. They, they don't look at the, at the where the where the digits are and maybe as de as, de as desperately as they should. But that's a management issue if that's the case. Mm -hmm. But to cut off all funding to the, to to things like what we're doing in Texas is to cut off fire protection and and EMS protection to two thirds of my state. Sure. Not they won't have it. They just won't have it effective. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got four in my district. We got the be we got the best training ranges in the entire United States Army at Fort Hood, with the exception of the National Training Center. Okay, that's that's where you learn the best. Mm -hmm. You train, and we train. We great. We're great trainers, and we've got great soldiers, and they're well trained. <laughs> but they all go through the National Training Center before they go to war, if, if it's available to us in the war situation. Because that, therefore, you save lives, you're more effective, you win battles. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's what this consortium <clears throat> is doing for the small towns and mid-sized towns of my state and of every state in this union. If it's the fact that universities are attached to it, then let's figure out a way to make it better. But explain to me why the, the, right. basically you're saying, I know I've heard yeah. we got to make bad cuts and all that stuff. Right. But I'm telling you, you will harm. Not, in my district is basically <laughs> suburban. Right. But you're right. still going to harm about 20 or 25 right. towns in my district. Yeah, and, and uh, by no means do we want to harm anybody. Uh, I'm just in a rock and a hard place when it comes to where I can prioritize our funding in a tough in a tough environment. When it comes to Texas A&M and the Texas system, look, they, they're it's a phenomenal system. We're working with them. We actually, if I remember correctly, we actually hired their uh, engineering s um, students to do home inspections. We had to perform over 2.4 million home inspections this year, which is one, we got to get to better technology and stop doing the manual process to begin with. But we are trying to find ways to engage universities, and universities do great work. I just, I'm in a rock and a hard, hard place when it comes to what we can fund and what we can't. I would love to be able to fund them all, but it's just not reality. Well, that seems to be your answer. Uh, I'm all for 
going in and, and doing surgery on the federal mm -hmm. government. I think it's yeah. a great idea. I'd be happy to work with you, sir. But but I, I I don't understand how I explain to some little small town that has one fire truck, and the only people they get to train them is go to A&M. And I've, I've graduated kids from high school. I taught Sunday school for 25 years. I've got at least five firefighters that I know of that I've taught. And Nirvana mm -hmm. for a firefighter in a small town is to go to A&M to that training center. Because mm -hmm. they come back with confidence. They know how to fight chemical fires. They know how to fight vehicle fires. They don't just know how to squirt water on a grass fire. Right. And they, they're better at, in every state for the people that live in their town for going there. Uh, and all I say is if it's wasteful, let's figure out a way to not be as wasteful. If you need share from the state, let's do a cooperative with the states or the locals, or whatever it needs, add a fee, whatever it needs, but to kill it is a pretty disastrous thing. Sure. This is Robert Allen. Uh, Administrator Long, as you can imagine, I get a lot of questions about uh, Puerto Rico and what's happening in, in Puerto Rico. Um, so, so the uh, my last two questions are related to to um, to Puerto Rico. Six months after Maria devastated Puerto Rico, the island still has a long way to go, as we've discussed. Mm -hmm. According to press reports, FEMA has received claims for assistance to repair over one million homes on the island, but fewer than 40 percent of those have been paid. And one reason for this delay is apparently a difficulty for mm -hmm. residents to prove they own their homes. Sure. And it has been reported that some transactions are based on verbal agreements and handshakes and never officially recorded. Other survivors uh, may have lost official documents uh, during the storm. Mm -hmm. FEMA needs uh, to find a way um, uh, and a long-term solution, or some residents may never be able to return home. So what is the current plan to help these homeowners? Uh, do you need additional authority from Congress to help solve this problem? And finally, uh, will you commit, if you need help from us, will you commit to providing us with technical assistance on what authority is needed to fix the mm -hmm. problem, including the authority to reimburse individuals who have made repairs at their own expense? Excellent question, and uh, you hit the nail on the head. This is a unique situation about home ownership that the agency has never run into before, and I don't know if it's a legislative fix or a policy fix, but what, what the concerning factor is is that you know, to protect the taxpaying dollars, I have to make sure that if I'm providing funding to fix a house that it actually gets done. And it's not that we don't trust anybody to do that. Um, you know, we're a very trusting organization, but if I do it and it's a, it's way, it turns into waste, fraud, and abuse, then I'll be called back before this committee uh, again saying that I lean too far forward. So let me get back to you on whether or not it's a legislative fix because it may need... Uh, I may need, hat, uh, once again, to ask you for special authority similar to looking the other way on the deferred maintenance uh, piece because we don't fix things that were not well maintained, uh, typically in disasters. Or I'm called before OIG again, uh, and, you know, and, and I, you're asking questions of why I'm doing that. So let me get back to you on whether or not it's a special authority or not. And then my final question is, uh, and I, I know you that you've uh, said that conditions on the island make recovery very difficult, which again, we've, mm -hmm. we've talked about. And a recent AP news story reported that in the village of Corozal, Puerto Rico, detailed their struggles with getting running water. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking about this one area of the town, a resident uh, said uh, practically no one has shown up here. The story is dated March 16th, 2018, and it reports that they still didn't have running water or electricity and had not received the generator that they had requested. Mm -hmm. uh, I had my staff share the article with your staff so that the subcommittee can get more detail about what is going on there and, and to have a better understanding of an area where the recovery seems to be struggling. Right. Uh, can you share uh, what you found out? <coughs> Are there any areas where we can be helpful? And is Corozal a good example of other areas in Puerto Rico? that are also struggling uh, to recover? So, excellent question too, and there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, on the water. So PRASA, uh, a majority of the PRASA system that services uh, uh, um, an overwhelming number of the 
population in Puerto Rico is back up and running. A lot of it's running, some of it's running on emergency power. Um, I have not read the article, but what I would probably assume is if it's a private well, what we typically do in that situation, if it's a private well that's not operational or has, you know, or no longer usable, we first have to understand whether or not you can actually put a generator on that well to, to pump the water out. And, and if so, what type of a generator? And if I remember correctly, we're working in mission assigning the EPA uh, to be able to go in and do that. And then if not, um, we are still mobilizing uh, water to communities like that through uh, water trucks or buffaloes or bottled water, and, and we're working with NGOs to make sure that they're getting out. But we can follow up on any specific area. I'd be happy to do that and, um, you know, make sure that we're not leaving any stones unturned. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Culbertson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Administrator Long, this um, – Rental assistance thing is really a problem. It just it really bothers me a lot because we've got people that's now been, it's on the brink of being eight months since the storm made landfall. And the Stafford Act says you can't discriminate on the basis of race, religion, national origin, creed, or income. Mm -hmm. Your rule online says you will not discriminate against people on the basis of income. And, and this is really a desperate problem for people. Uh, the law is clear. Your rule is clear. Um, there's no reason for there to be any delay with this. You've got the authority. I know your heart's in the right place. Uh, I guarantee it's it's lawyers arguing with each other that's got you worried. And I'm a pretty good lawyer myself. As a judge will tell you, the other thing is I'm relentless. Uh, I don't turn loose once I get a hold of something, do I, Judge? No, you don't. I'm not turning loose of this. You've got the authority to do this. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I'm going to use every tool that this committee's got to help the lawyers. Not you. It's the lawyers underneath you, the, the problem. Uh, I figured out a way to get the Department of Justice to change a sanctuary city policy without ever passing a bill, with no language in my CJS bill, just using good common sense and good lawyering in existing law. I'm telling you, the law supports you on this. Sure. I'm really counting on you to get this done. I'm not turning loose of it. Okay. And you can do this immediately. Just go tell those lawyers, get out of the way. Get her done. Okay. I'm coming. Thank you, sir. Elberson's after us. Thank you. <laughs> um I really appreciate that. That's very important. These people are really hurting. Understand. That's something you can do right away to help them. Deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, you can also, one of the things you've got authority to do is to let people use the mitigation grants when a property is purchased. The law is ambiguous. I believe it gives you a little daylight where you could give the homeowner the flexibility to use that grant to lift a new structure. Right now they are limited to lifting an existing structure, which makes no sense, because if you said many times, nobody's going to take better care of a piece of property than the property owner. Right. Uh, or the governor's going to do a better job than the governor. That, that's the genius of what Mr. Jefferson and the founders left us, is to let local authorities and state authorities handle things, and individual Americans handle things that affected themselves and their own families. So I, uh, are, are you familiar with this, and can you... Take, if you're I, not, I'm not familiar with the exact issue, but I will go back to my Region 6 staff to make sure you. I fully understand it. Absolutely. Thank you, because I think this is one you do have the uh, discretion okay. to let the grant, because today they're just the grant, again, is only being used to lift an old existing structure. Okay. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Thank really you. appreciate it. Yeah. I look forward to working with you and uh, the chairman <laughs> to help resolve this rental assistance problem and others. Okay. Anything thank else you. you need to All get right. her done? Thank you. Thank you. Get her done. We, uh, we thank you for coming here today. Um, I commend you for trying to fix a broken system. Uh, the issue that it always affects is when you broke, fix a broken system and you don't mine down into it to see what the consequences are gonna be. And I think we heard a lot about that today. Uh, don't give up on trying, but mine down in there and see if there's alternatives. Yes, sir. It's really what we need to look to do. Uh, I'm no fan of the federal government running everything. But then when you think about it, there's X number of states in the union that historically have disasters. If oh, the burden is all put all on those states, those states are going to be overburdened as we try to make sure that the economy of the entire nation functions effectively. We, uh, for one thing, the Gulf Coast is where I would argue 90, but it's probably 80 percent of all the petroleum that we produce in this country is refined. 
therefore a major sector of our energy economy could could be lost if we didn't do do a lot of work down there on the coast it, it's not refined in other places so therefore you got to that becomes a federal nexus is my in my opinion i just encourage you to keep trying but think about ask and think of, and, and learn about the consequences especially to the little guy the little guys, they don't have the resources, the big boys. Sure. If you got anything further? All right, then we'll, we'll recess, and thank you for being here.